Robert, 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 Robert will probably be better talking about this subject than I, <laughs> because he's more of an expert on French literature than I am. But um, there were two or three things that qualify me to talk about Charles de Peggy. One of them is that I've been living in France for 20 years. I've been getting to know um, in, in French Catholic circles and in French political life and French cultural life, um, what an enormous figure Peggy was and how all sorts of different sectors of French society have claimed him as their own. And that comes from living in France. Um, secondly, through my interest in education, um, there's an aspect of Peggy's thinking um, which is very dear to my heart, and that is what has been called le réel, the real. Um, there's an American um, writer on education called John Senior, who um, wrote a number of books in the 70s, um, one called The Restoration of Christian Culture, after he'd written another book called The Devastated Vineyard. He was a a humanities professor at the University of Kansas. And there was a program which he and a few other teachers came up with called the Integrated Humanities Program, where um, they would sit down, in those days, whether you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever in the States, you had to, to have some humanities element to, to your course in the first couple of years. And this program became quite popular because it was quite an easy one. You just sat down and listened to the professors discussing with each other and then you wrote a paper at the end of the term. And, uh, and it was entertaining. So there were all these different, there were four or five professors involved. Um, Senior was the only very serious Catholic amongst them. The others weren't necessarily Catholic or were even Christian at all, but they were, they were interested in, um, uh, in a kind of sort of bloom kind of way in, in, in the Western canon. And, and, and in the power of, of great thinking. Um, uh, Robert mentioned something about Matthew Arnold and Roger Scruton, who we'll hear something about a little bit later on, um, talking about the way in which perhaps literature and the arts might um, save us from the abyss that, that religion had, had tried to keep us from falling into before and how perhaps that wasn't working out so well. Um, uh, this was this was kind of the idea between the, behind the Inter integrated humanities program was the power of of great books of the best that has been thought and said um, to um, to inform and inspire and um, affect our, our, our humanity. And uh, what came out of this integrated humanities program was a lot of conversions to Catholicism, so it was shut down. Um, but one of the things that um, Senior, John Senior, wrote about a lot was this idea of the real. And the idea there is, um, uh, one of the things he said in, in, in his book, uh, The Restoration of Christian Culture, was that um, um, families should buy old houses in the downtown, it's the American perspective, um, not install central heating. Um, buy an old piano. And <laughs> why no central heating? Because then the teenagers wouldn't retreat to their own rooms. The families would, would commune together. Why the old piano? Because they wanted real music and not synthetic music. Um, and there was a kind of, uh, you know, sort of uh, E.F. Schumacher, smallest beautiful kind of thread to all of this. So this is, if you like, the... Um, the kind of Christian left of people like E.F. Schumacher, which is against the big capitalist monster. Um, it's kind of Catholic social teaching, all that sort of thing. And it's no surprise that someone like Peggy was involved with the political left in France, but has ended up being a champion of, or claimed as a, as a champion of the Catholic right, um, nationalist right. But he was a complicated person too. He was somebody who um, was drawn to Catholicism, was drawn to the, the Catholic spirit of France, particularly medieval France, but really wasn't completely reconciled to it until 
until he was until he was dying. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about his poetics, um, unlike uh, Robert's treatment of, of Rimbaud, because uh, Peggy's poetics are really the poetics of the naive. <laughs> he's, he's, a lot of people accuse him of being childish. Um, it's rather like Antoine de Saint-Exupéry or something like that, the Le Petit Prince. It's just very, very straightforward, conversational, chatty poetry, um, arrestingly simple. Uh, particularly in the poem that I'm going to be mm. talking to you about, um, which is a poem about I hope. I can't hear anything. Can you not hear me? I can see now. Now it's okay. Yeah, it must be your computer jumped for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Is everyone else okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm. This is going to be boring for Anthony because I sent him this paper already. This is really a rehash of a paper I did. For for um, a, a, a Polish magazine that I'm involved with as, as a language editor. This will be interesting to Katarina. There's a, some people in the University of Lublin who, um, in the philosophy department there, who publish a magazine called Ethos or Ethos, but every so often there's an English edition. And um, they also publish some books. And because they all speak um, pidgin English without any article, his problem article is problem <laughs> Polish people. So, so my job is to go through and put all the those and as in and take the uh, as and those that shouldn't be there it's very big problem <laughs> so they said to me well would you write something write something um write something french so the only thing i could think of think of was peggy and uh, so this was this is my first essay of writing um, a literary article for a Polish philosophical journal, which I'm now going to kind of bastardize as a as a paper as a talk. Hello. I, I'm sorry. Uh, just a question. Can uh, afterwards can we have your scripts? Yeah, sure. Me, because okay. I mean yeah. I'm listening and I understand everything, but it's hard for me to concentrate all the time because it's a foreign language for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't worry. We, we, yeah. We'll we'll come up with something. Especially as I'm a very boring speaker. I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking <laughs> next year in Latin. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm sorry. So you'll be happy to know that um, I'm not going to speak French. Uh, like okay. Robert's okay. talk, I'm, it's all translated into English. Most of it translated by me, but some other people as well have had a hand in the translation. I picked it from other books. But most of it's my own version. So I'm going to talk to you about a book on, on hope, where hope is represented as a little girl, and that will come out in the story as I go through. Um, and, and to start with, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what hope is, because hope was, was the theme of this particular issue of our, our, our magazine in, in Poland. That's, a, that's the background to why I've picked this book about hope. So, Here's a quote from Charles Peggy, the portal of the mystery of the second virtue, right? Faith, hope, and charity. So hope is the second one of them. The faith that I love best, says God, is hope. Faith doesn't surprise me. No, it's not surprising. I'm so resplendent in my creation that in order not to see me, these poor people would have to be blind. Charity, says God. No, that doesn't surprise me. Sorry. It's not surprising. These poor creatures are so miserable that unless they had a heart of stone, how could they not have love for each other? But hope, says God, now that's something that surprises me. Even me, that is surprising. For the ancient Greeks, hope or elpis was a kind of blind trust in an unknown future. The idea that everything would turn out well in the end, even if such an attitude was in vain. This was what was left for Pandora in Hesiod's tale after she had opened the forbidden box or rather jar. It was a cruel trick of the gods. Later, and especially among Renaissance scholars, there was the interpretation with which we moderns are more familiar, hope as a kind of divine blessing for the unfortunate Pandora. In the 16th century, Andrea Alciato in his Emblemata and Gabriele Ferno in his Centum Fabulae both saw hope as a happy, consolation. 
But should Elpis, in fact, be viewed as an evil, just like all the others in the same jar that escaped when Pandora opened it? That is how Hesiod and most of his Greek contemporaries, Roman contemporaries too, saw it. How could hope be an evil? Precisely because blind optimism leads man to ignore the true desperation of his state. If not evil, then at least for modern man, absurd. It's a perennial question. And the idea and the answer to it rather depends on your view of God and of religion. Of course, in one sense, questions of hope defy reason. It always depends on whether one wants to see things positively or negatively. Some people are hopeful almost by disposition. Some of them are not, even if all of them are more or less hopeless. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, however, hope assumes not just a moral quality, but also a definite end goal, the beata spares of the mass, referring to life in heaven and enjoyment of the beatific vision of God. This kind of hope makes a difference to our life and behavior here and now on this earth and in the future. Hope together with faith and charity is one of the three theological virtues of Christian theology. It unites in one habit of mind the desire for a particular good together with the expectation of receiving it. To be precise, it's the virtue that looks forward to union with God and its accompanying eternal beatitude. St. Thomas writes that while faith is a function of the intellect, hope is a function of or an act of the will. In fact, he talks about two kinds of hope. First, in his discussion of the passions common to man and other animals and later as one of the theological virtues. This first kind of hope we can share with a dog. The treat of the hope who hopes for, for a treat for his good behavior. For both man and dog, hope is a movement of the appetitive power ensuing from the apprehension of a future good, difficult but possible to obtain. Perhaps St. Thomas didn't know about Pavlov's dog. <laughs> In its theological dimension, hope has three distinctive attributes. God is his object. It is God who infuses it in us. And um, it is also he who reveals it to us through sacred scripture. So as with happiness, there's a certain kind of hope that can be obtained by our own powers, but whose perfection is only possible through divine grace. The Catechism of the Catholic Church explains, hope is the theological virtue by which we desire the kingdom of heaven, and eternal life as our happiness, placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying not on our own strength, but on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Yet it adds that although the theological virtue of hope depends entirely on God, it does in fact correspond to something, a disposition, which already exists within our own nature, to the aspiration to happiness which God has placed in the heart of every man. Because we can say then that although Christian hope springs from faith in Christ and trust in his promises and is an infused gift of God, a certain kind of hope is already present in those who are seeking God and who are open to the gift of faith. This is a fruit of that prevenient grace portrayed by Cardinal Journey as an arrow aimed by God at his beloved creatures, the quickening and assisting grace already explored by the Council of Trent. Perhaps it could be possible to say in the light of this that nobody is beyond hope. Or to put it differently, anyone may be permitted to hope. Perhaps for many, it's a good place to start. It's like a little child holding out its hand to us. How can we refuse it? In all our definitions of hope, we've not yet mentioned what might be considered as hope's opposite, despair. For modern man, that temptation to give in to end it all is an even more pressing question. And yet, for most of us, we don't give up. And it's more than an animal survival instinct, even if that is part of it. It is more than a reaction against our fear of the unknown after death, Hamlet's undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. It is because God's arrow is not far away, ready to wound us and win us. And the tip of that arrow is surely hope. In this view of hope, in fact, is this view of hope, I should say, too presumptuous, too optimistic, 
too hopeful. So much for trying to decide what hope is and what hope is not. But in the lived reality of our relationship with God, it is ultimately more important to experience hope than it is to define it. Pope John Paul II in his apostolic letter, Tertio Millennio Advenienti, the Jubilee, Jubilee year, invited us to a renewed appreciation of the theological virtue of hope. The basic attitude of hope, on the one hand, encourages the Christian, he says, not to lose sight of the final goal, which gives meaning and value to life. And on the other, offers solid and profound reasons for a daily commitment to transform reality in order to make it correspond to God's plan. For the recently canonized John Henry Newman, hope is about watching and waiting. The Lord has come and gone, and now we wait, as he wrote in his poem, Hope. But this hope, or a close relative of it, is a free gift inscribed on all the hearts of men. For Newman, such is the definition of every religious man who has not the knowledge of Christ, he is on the lookout. Hope somehow is already inscribed on our hearts in anticipation of the gift of faith. She is like the arrow of predestination envisaged by Cardinal Jolet, shot from God's bow and seeking out every human soul. But once the gift of faith is explicitly welcomed, that hope assumes a new force and a new urgency. As Newman teaches again, we are not simply to believe, but to watch, not simply to love, but to watch, not simply to obey, but to watch, to watch for what? For that great event, Christ's coming. An author who is considered the issue of hope was then our Charles Peggy. For him, the virtue of hope is possible even when the light of faith has itself grown very dim. Like a little child, hope leads us by the hand and leads the tired pair of faith and love onwards, looking forward to our bright future in heaven. Charles Pierre Peggy was born on the January the 7th, 1873 in Orléans, France, and died on the field of battle on the 5th of September, 1914, at the beginning of the First World War. He was a French writer, poet, essayist, and a reserve military officer. His works include medieval-inspired mysteries in free verse, of which his famous text about hope, which we'll call the porch of the mystery of the second virtue, the portal of the mystery of the second virtue, originally published in 12, 1912, is one. He also published collections of more conventional verse poems, um, less naive, such as La Tapisserie de Notre Dame, The Tapestry of Our Lady, 1913, also of mystical inspiration, focused on St. Joan of Arc, very much a patriotic symbol for a France undergoing difficult times. In the context of the stormy French fin de siècle, he was a committed intellectual, first a libertarian socialist activist, attracted to anti-clericalism, an outspoken Dreyfusard during his studies. He moved from 1908 towards a nationalist and medievalist kind of Catholicism. A common theme throughout his poetry is a preoccupation with social justice, as well as a kind of despair about the state of the modern world, or at least a, a profound ennui with it anyway. In this, as in some other respects, he prefigures the much better known Albert Camus, who in 1942, in his myth of Sisyphus, observes man's eternal optimism, his misguided optimism, uh, and his search for meaning to his travail Camus, Camus recalls the punishment of the gods meted out to Sisyphus for attempting to free men from death. He is condemned to roll a boulder up to the top of a hill, only to see it fall down again, before he hopefully rolls it back up again, over and over again, for all eternity. For Camus, with his philosophy of the absurdity of life, there is no hope and no meaning to this existence of ours. Hence the mantra of his hopeless hero, Merceau, in his 1942 novel, L'Etranger, cela veut, ne veut rien dire. That doesn't mean anything. If, if you haven't read it, it's about, it's about a man who, who doesn't seem to have a normal psychology at all, who doesn't really seem to have any emotions. <laughs> and um, he's just very, very honest about everything. 
and, uh, and in the end, um, he's executed. He's a kind of a, an absurdist Christ. It's a very disturbing book, but it's on all, it's on the school syllabuses for A level. Most um, has been for years. All those who hope are roundly ridiculed in this absurdist gospel that ends with the banal execution of its rather autistic Messiah. With Peggy though, suffering humanity seeks meaning and hope and finds them in the promises of Christ, reclothed in all their gospel freshness and authenticity by the engaging voice of a child, a little girl. The enduring impression one has of Peggy is of a man of faith who combined a revolutionary spirit with a counter-revolutionary spirit, motivated by a very raw and human love and concern for other human beings and their fate. Of course, this produced tensions within him not least in his practice of the faith. Before his death, he is known to have abstained for Holy Communion for several years over his difficulty with the doctrine of eternal punishment for sinners. With him, in fact, his instinct to hope was so deep, so simple and so single-minded that he couldn't believe anyone could ever go beyond it, could ever be beyond it. Before providing some highlights from Peggy's great hymn to hope, I will explore the context into which he was born, a divided and hopeless culture, exasperated by its institutions, torn between religion and science, and prone to extreme and polarizing tendencies. France at that time had a great deal in common with our own time, and perhaps that is why a voice such as Peggy's seems again so pertinent and is being taken up again by all kinds of people from different perspectives. Even today, he's claimed by the right and the left. Considering Peggy's concern with the sufferings and dignity of the poor, the importance of roots and tradition, the Catholic faith, as also his mistrust of systems, hierarchy and clericalism. It's no wonder that humanly concerned, he felt dismay in the early 1900s at the prospects for France. And things were only to get worse in the 30 years following his death. It is this context of a divided and partisan society which accounts at least in part for the way in which it took unclassifiable figures hostile to vested interests such as Peggy, Leon Blois, Arthur Rambeau, who we've heard about, and Camus later. Not all of them Catholic or fully Catholic and each of them a severe critic of the Catholic and secular establishments. To reach so many future converts from different sectors of a disturbed and divided culture and provide them with different bridges back to faith. The fact that two men seem both keenly aware of the hopelessness of the human condition, perhaps especially as experienced in their French context, begs the question, where does this sense of ennui come from? Why is it so characteristic of France at the end of the 19th and first half of the 20th centuries? A quick and easy answer would be that it was all part of the fallout of the French Revolution century or so before. And it is true enough that nothing was ever the same again in France or in the world after that event. But the specific feeling of ennui and the resultant desperate search for meaning is so, something very characteristic of this, this period, beginning a century after the revolution. There was, of course, shame from the defeat of France in the Franco-Prussian War, a feeling that no doubt fed extreme nationalist sentiments. There was also a certain sadness and apprehension as the champions of scientific progress seemed to be banishing re religion from serious public consideration and from the public square. And yet, in this context, there were also convert scientists such as Ferdinand Brunetier, editor of the Revue des Deux Mondes, and author in 1895 of the Explosive Science and Religion, as well as pious and productive academics such as Louis Pasteur, together with a whole host of decadent poets on both sides of the English Channel, who in considerable numbers returned one by one to historic Christianity, just when it seemed like a lost cause. The evidence of this ennui and its relationship to what could be called the Catholic movement are worth examining in three particular fields. The political situation of France at the time, that of the literary men who chronicled this feeling of malaise and lived it out in their own turbulent decadent lives. And lastly, those philosophers and poets who could be counted as activists seeking out real world solutions. 
to this national state of despair. French politics in this period was riddled with tensions and scandals. A large part, especially Catholics and proletarians of the French public, were radically out of sympathy with the government that was an anti-clerical government. Don't forget this was the time when there was a separation of church and state. All the church's property was, was, was confiscated in 1905. Um, the time when, when Peggy was, was um, undergoing his conversion really to this sort of medieval kind of Catholicism was the time when all the monks <laughs> had been kicked out of the country. Uh, La Grande Chartreuse, Solemn, they were all closed down. There were soldiers guarding them to make sure nobody would take them back again. It was, it was a really, it was like another revolution was going on in France at that time. Um, but most ordinary people were not in sympathy with what the government was doing. And that government had only come to power through military intervention and bloody, bloody reprisals against the communards. Of course, there's the commune as well. Uh, and the subterfuge right through the 1870s. Um, this had been going on. Of course, there were the royalists as well. It was, it was a mess. Scandal after scandal involving these and other tensions continued to shake the Republic to its foundations. Uh, right through um, right, right, right through the second half of the 19th century, culminating with the, with the famous Dreyfus case, where, of course, there was this officer who was Jewish, um, who was accused of something he hadn't done. Of course, he was innocent, but it, it, many, many Catholics thought, well, he could just take one for the team because we don't want our institutions to be kind of denigrated. You know? It's a little bit like um, it, the, 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 the Pharisees saying it is better that one man should suffer for the people. It was that kind of situation. But it divided France right down the middle. Uh, even Pius X in 1905 intervened um, with regard to the kind of anti-Jewish sentiment there was amongst Catholics, Pius the Thir Leo XIII had done the same and had also tried to get the Catholics in France to accept the Republic and, and to give up trying to restore the monarchy, which was a constant cause of plots and conspiracies against the state. In order for Catholics to be accepted in turn, that was the Pope's idea, so that they could play their full part in civic society. The socialist movement also continued to grow under the leadership of Jean Jaurès, but Peggy became disillusioned with him and broke with the movement. Many of these problems stemmed from the Franco-Prussian War and its subsequent uh, aftermath, with the loss of Alsace-Lorraine, provoking an enduring revenge mentality against the monks, the French, that poisoned French politics. Um, and so the whole country was divided in an increasingly um, explosive atmosphere, nowhere perhaps more better demonstrated than the Dreyfus affair. The anti-Dreyfusar included agnostic, agnostic nationalists like Charles Maurras, sophisticated agnostics like Paul Valéry and Saint-Saëns, military men and large numbers of Catholics fearful of the leftist attack and the on the conservative and mostly Catholic friendly army. The pro-Dreyfus camp included um, such unlikely bedfellows as Peggy and the essentially um, anti-Catholic bourgeois Zola, Emile Zola, La Bête Humaine, Thérèse Racan, all those kind of pessimistic, very dark books. Um, the so-called decadent movement was a kind of chronicle of the listless nature of fin de siècle France as well as a reaction to it. Key precursors of Peggy were Baudelaire, who's been mentioned, Rimbaud, Verlaine, Riesmans, Ennui and Spleen are central to Baudelaire's poems, but Baudelaire linked them to the sinful condition of man. His, sol his solution was ultimately Catholic with his love of beauty, truth and order. He was initially prepared to take whatever means were necessary to achieve visionary intensity in, in his poems, I'm talking about Baudelaire here. Later, however, his revulsion at the falseness of narcotically enhanced experience and fear for his soul led him to condemn these experiences in the strongest terms. Any man who does not accept the conditions of this life sells his soul, said Baudelaire later. 
the youthful Rambo, idealized Baudelaire and agreed with his analysis of man's condition. His solution was to achieve personal transcendence and illumination through a systematic disordering of the senses, rolling around in the gutter, basically. Um, we've, we've, we've heard also about Verlaine, who also led a dissolute life. Um, both Rambo and pre-conversion of Verlaine were anti-bourgeois, anti-clerical radicals, whose political and social positions were um, basically destructive. Um, but all of these had a kind of impact on Catholic poets of the fin de siècle, but ni neither Rambo or Verlaine um, were really interested in social reform, social justice. Um, a few years later, however, there were men who proposed socio-political solutions men who were outward looking and earnest. They were especially the outrageous antisocial challenges of Barbe d'Aurevilly and his one-time disciple Blois. Mm -hmm. The work of both men uh, involved savage indictments of modern life and pessimistic analyses of human nature. Politically, Barbe was an ultra-traditionalist reactionary whilst Blois was a sign of contradiction to any kind of compromise with ordinary life. And Blois' condemnation of the generality of contemporary Catholic clergy and Catholic activism and literature was as vitriolic as his view of sexual, secular society. Action Francaise, founded in the final years of the 19th century, was a reactionary movement and um, magazine journal dedicated under, under Charles Maurras, dedicated to restoring the king and the Catholic Church's central position in French life. And it was particularly hostile to Jews. Uh, presu pres presu they were perceived as being impossible to assimilate into, into, into France um, on cultural and ethnic grounds. It wasn't to do with religion, really. Um, and, and lots of Catholics supported this at this time. Hence the intervention of the popes in the, in the first years of the 20th century. So in an age of panicky extremes and faced with the same set of problems, Peggy took another path, a completely different path. He was not at home with the leaders of this movement. He says, for me, Blois, Ousmans, and Barbie d'Aubrilleville, they're antipathetic to me, antipathetic to me. As far as I'm concerned, they are pornographers, he said. As for Peggy and his relationship with his recent Catholic literary patrimony, it's safe to say that he resembles his great precursors in certain individual respects. In Baudelaire's ultimate conviction of the primacy of human nature as the union of body and soul, in Rambo's instrumentalizing of poetry for higher purposes, in Verlaine's writing specifically Catholic poetry in response to crises, and in Barbe d'Aurevilly's flaying of sec sectarian secularism, in Blois' uncompromising independence of factions, including official Catholic ones, and in his mystical view of France and history. In Action Francaise's and even more or less Catholic Republican Maurice Bauer's cult of St. Joan of Arc. And so Peggy then was drawing together all these threads and combining, revisiting them um, at this moving from the fin de siècle to the beginning of the, the 20th century. Finally, the philosophical inference of Bergson, Henri Bergson, 1859 to 1941, uh, also uh, actually was a Jewish, secular Jewish um, philosopher, um, active in the early 1900s. He advocated what became known as realism, le réel, which was in part a reaction against the perceived disconnection between academic philosophy and ordinary everyday people's lives. Peggy first heard Bergson's lectures when he was a student at the École Normale Supérieure, where he became a devotee, even going to the trouble of transcribing Bergson's lectures and publishing them, because Bergson was lecturing off the top of his head. Um, Peggy transcribed them and published them as pamphlets. 
Although their thinking later diverged, in the early days, the influence not, was not all one way. Bergson even admitted that Peggy seemed to have understood what he was thinking before he actually found a way of expressing it. In fact, maybe, maybe some of the power of the expression of Bergson's ideas was Peggy's own. Part of this notion of the real meant a certain kind of permission given to the emotions, to human feelings. In his notes sur Monsieur Bergson et la philosophie bergsonienne, Peggy asserts that the passions are not inferior to the intellect. Very unscientific proposition at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. As long as those passions are noble, in simple terms, perhaps one could say that the voice of experience and the voice of the heart find their way back into a philosophical discourse hitherto overwhelmed under the, un, under the weight of logic. As saint Zubiri's little petit prince would say a generation later, later, this is my secret, it is very simple. One only sees well with the heart. On ne voit bien, pas bien avec le cœur. What is truly real, l'essentiel, in, in saint Exupéry's language, is invisible only to the eye, is invisible to the eyes. You can only see it with your heart. In his work, Peggy took this idea further than Bergson did, perhaps because he was more of a poet than a philosopher. It is this commitment to what, what, what might call an incarnational intellectualism linked to real people and real feelings that causes Peggy, for all his reputed mysticism, to be committed to the hilt to engaging with the great social implications of Catholicism and France and the people of France, particularly in hoping, and as it were, mystically seeing an eventual resolution like a prophet, um, seeing a, a resolution to the endless conflicts and factions that tore his country apart. And perhaps we can conclude in some measure, before having a look at the poetry, um, that in some measure he succeeded, as unusually in so faction-riven a country as France has been since the revolution, Peggy has been claimed by virtually every party as one of their own, which is a mark of his success. And so our little girl Hope, I want to tell you a little bit about this very arresting um, image of L'Espérance. Peggy's epic treatment of Hope takes the, strange, takes the form of a strange monologue called Le Porche du Mystère, La Deuxième Vertu, or The Portal of the Mystery of the Second Virtue, published in 1911, three years before he died in which St. Joan of Arc is receiving a long catechism lesson framed as a dramatic monologue from a Franciscan nun called Madame Gervais. The idea, so Joan of Arc receiving a catechism lesson from Madame Gervais, okay, who's very chatty. And the idea of the medieval porch of a French cathedral makes one think of the medieval mystery plays that were presented under them, but also of those busy carved scenes so full of saints and allegories with all those lovely smiles. If you, if you, if you, can, if you can imagine what the, these medieval pictures, everyone with beautiful smiles, very much giving a tangible aspect to the truths of the faith. They're very physical and often characterized by the smiles of, of Our Lady particularly. The tangible, the real, as we have seen, something very central for Peggy, very much influenced by these early works of Bergson, who sought to create a metaphysic which aimed to reveal the réel and thus was endowed with an organic force, permitting it to be related to life in all sorts of new and fruitful ways, which are impossible in the case of logically self-contained systems, which content them themselves with being merely vrai, that is, put together in such a way so as to satisfy the intellect. They might be vrai, but they're not réel. For Peggy, the discipleship of the réel is also, and preeminently, incarnational, so that he has been hailed as the poet who enshrined the incarnated word, incarnate word. In the Porsche, or the portal, Madame Gervais presents to the young Joan the idea that hope has perhaps been overshadowed by faith and charity. There is even the idea that hope is almost more accessible and more friendly for the agnostic or the seeker 
I ought to mention that the reason why Madame Gervaise is catechizing Joan is because Joan will be the future savior of France. So this is, this is the kind of the, the backstory. So the hope is not just an individual hope, the hope of salvation, it's also hope for, for a society, a French society. Um, so, so there's even an idea that hope is almost more accessible and more friendly for the agnostic, that it can, by God's grace, lead us to the fullness of faith. If one were to speak of a temporal procession of the theological virtues, which is perhaps a little bit dodgy, a little right, a temporal procession is the idea, you know, the filioque, the Father and the Son, and receive the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. So that's what I mean by a temporal procession. It's the way that we receive these virtues, not, no, not how they are set up themselves in the abstract. Hope can be seen as coming first, even without, even if without, uh, sorry, even if without at least implicit faith, it would be impossible. The perspectives of the convert and the sinner are naturally turned to the last things, as much through fear as through hope. And this perspective needs to be restored to the Christian life, to cure us of all sentimentalism, ritualism, or even activism, all of which are extremes into which a Christian can fall when he forgets that the object of our hope, um, forgets the object of our hope to be forever one with Christ in the beatific vision. So Madame Gervais, then, with her lessons of catechism, her reminiscences of things that a friendly, almost avuncular God, the Father, has said to her. Uh, her, her God, the Father, is like an old farmer or something who chats to her in his kitchen. Um, in fact, the main voice that speaks through the poem is God's through her, her visions, her tales of the saints. And she's addressing the young girl who one day awaken France from its slumber and call it back to faith and action. It's clear that Peggy is also there by addressing the Frenchmen of the early 20th century, who seem to have lost hope in the vocation of their country. To have lost hope in God's promises, to have lost energy and direction. Here is how Peggy describes the three theological virtues. Um, and this is Madame Gervais reporting what, what God told her. For my three virtues, said God, the three virtues, my creatures, my daughters, my children, are themselves like my other creatures of the race of men. Faith is a loyal wife, charity is a mother, a loving mother, all heart, or an elder sister who's like a mother. Hope oh, is a little slip of a girl. In Peggy's poem, we see that perhaps when Christ says, unless you become like this child, he's giving us a teaching about hope illustrated by the hope that lights up the face of every little child, something which never ceases to move me as a school teacher when I see it, and which in Peggy's vision even seems to move God himself. That these poor children see how things are going and still believe tomorrow things will go better. <laughs> that they see how things are going today and they believe they'll go better tomorrow morning. That's surprising. And it's by, fair that by far the greatest marvel of our grace I'm even surprised by it myself, says God. Thus, for Peggy, even God is surprised by the power of hope. What surprises me, says God, is hope. I just can't get over it. This little hope who seems like nothing at all, this little girl, hope. The young girl, hope, leads the more august pair of faith and charity into the light. The little child shall lead them, as Isaiah said. We indicated above Newman's image of hope as a watchman whose desire for a better life keeps him alert. But for Peggy, hope is also playful and energetic, like a toddler. It is a lively connection to that idea of the real, le réel, that keeps our eyes open like a watchman's, even when we first found faith and charity. It is linked to joy. The child remains always joyful. The adult is tired and needs, as C.S. Lewis was, to be surprised by joy. It can happen that a form of religion takes root where faith and charity have become established habits, that the playful alertness of hope, like that of this little child, have just dried up. Religion can become just a system. And in this way, whilst materialists, whether they be communists or capitalists, live by a physical mechanism, so the scholastics, 
can end up promoting little more than a spiritual, spiritual mechanism. For Peggy, even Holy Mother Church can be entombed in her rigidity, in her administration and her bureaucracy. That's also from that note, Sola Philosophie Bergsonienne. The great 20th century theologian Hans von Balthasar saw in Peggy precisely the same polemic against the spirit of systematization that Kierkegaard conducted against Hegelianism. <coughs> that way of thinking can itself go too far. After all, men like St. Thomas and St. Anselm were monks and great contemplatives, and their systematization perhaps sprang from profound intuitions of the divinely ordained beauty and order in all things. They were mystics as well. But on the other hand, those who sought later to package the early schoolmen in concise manuals for easy consumption in seminaries might more accurately reflect a bureaucratic tendency. And so it was that men such as de Lubac and von Balthasar before and after Vatican II underlined a need for ressourcement, a rejuvenating drink from the springs of tradition before any thought of aggiornamento. These men sensed, like Peggy before them, the tiredness of hope's venerable guardians, faith and charity, in the need for a certain refreshment of our initial joy in the Lord. There are, philosophically, echoes of Kierkegaard's repetition or Heide Heidegger's retrieval, Wiederholung, but without the difficulty of abstraction, because we're dealing, we're dealing with le réel. Because for Peggy, hope is a little girl. And, as the god of Peggy's poem says, children are more my creatures than men are. Peggy's God suggests that perhaps every child is an icon of hope. Hope became for Peggy a central preoccupation, as Amore had been for Dante, as Dante's childhood darling Beatrice, uh, an embodiment of pure love, was his guide to the mysteries of God. So with Peggy, this little girl Hope, based on his own daughter Germaine, who was then nine years old, was the key to a deeper acceptance of the faith. In fact, perhaps within, without the inspiration of his children and this intuition about hope which they gave him, Peggy might never have made the ultimate submission with confession and Holy Communion that he made a couple of weeks before his death in battle. For several years, he'd been openly Catholic in a climate of widespread anti-clericalism, even if he had held quietly back on full assent to Catholic teaching, as I mentioned before, due to some theological difficulties. His conversion story is very much in the context of the fin de siècle literary scene in England and France, where intellectuals in considerable numbers rejected anti-Catholicism and scientism in favor of a return to religion in general terms. He also had a particular reason to connect childhood and hope. In 1911, two years before his death, his youngest child, Pierre, fell dangerously ill. Peggy set off on a pil pilgrimage to Chartres. Je vais faire un pèlerinage à Chartres, he wrote. Um, he marched alone on foot, 80 kilometers a day. He prayed to Our Lady. He did not ask her to cure his child. That was her affair. He was a busy man. He had an office and a thousand cares. He simply gave the child to her, all his children, and the boy was cured. Of course, bien sûr wrote Peggy. That's the only thing he wrote about the cure, bien sûr. Although he said little about it, this episode did mark him profoundly. Um, shortly before his death in battle in September 1914, he began but didn't finish his Note conjointe sur Monsieur Descartes et la philosophie cartésienne, in which he exp explains that in the portal of the mystery of the second virtue, the meaning and the strength and the vocation, so to speak, the virtue of the one who had we have named the young child Espérance, hope, burst onto the scene. She is the source of life because she is the one who constantly undoes habits. She is the seed of all spiritual birth. She is the source and the overflowing of grace. She is the one who constantly strips us of mortal clothing of habit. And it is not in vain that she is theological because she is the child princess of the theological virtues. And she is the Dauphine and the daughter of France. 
and it is not in vain that she walks in the middle between her two big sisters and that her two big sisters give her their hand. They do not give their hand in the sense that we believe because she is small, she is believed to need others to walk. But it is the others on the contrary who need her and who are happy to give her their hand to walk for faith without her would have grown too accustomed to this world and without her charity would have grown too accustomed to the poor man and so faith without her and charity without her each have gotten too accustomed even to god himself here peggy sees the little girl hope as charged with constantly upsetting our habits she is charged with always beginning afresh she is charged with everywhere bringing about beginnings just as habit brings about everywhere endings and deaths. She is charged with bringing about organisms, whereas habit brings about everywhere mechanisms. She is the principle, this child is the principle of recreation, where habit is the principle of decreation. She is the ever young agent of creation and grace. The two others, faith and charity, have their distinct function, but without her, who has no distinct function, the distinct functions of the two others would gradually get bogged down and, and enslaved to habit. We may reasonably be co concerned by Peggy's opposition between habit and creativity, but should not read into it a criticism of the forging of good habits of character. Peggy, always an honest paysan, countryman by heart at heart, would not fall into that rarefied way of thinking. Rather, in the portal, the four cardinal virtues of prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice are represented as the four sturdy legs of a Lorraine cart horse, pulling a plough that represents our relationship with God. Plough having three sides, if you see what I mean, um, based on faith, hope, and charity. Here, this is from this is in the the poem. This plough behind it ploughs the land of Lorraine but ploughs it on one condition, that one should also pull it along. Like the plough horse, the good animal must not only carry and move itself on its four legs and its four feet, but together must drag this plough, which thus animated behind it ploughs the earth. And so it is with the soul, this beast of burden, in an earthly ploughing, a carnal ploughing. Not only must the soul move and be carried along by the four virtues, pulling and dragging itself, but it must also drag, and that it drag this body sunk in the earth, which ploughs behind her the soil of the earth. So our body is like our, our gross body, <laughs> the Buddhists might say, our body with its four sturdy legs is of, of, of um, the, the four um, of prudence, temperance, fortune and justice is pulling along this spiritual plough of the three theological virtues. Here we see that for Peggy, anything that is truly only absolutely, anything that is true is only absolutely real when it's incarnated, inserted into the concrete tangibility of things. In this case, in the work of the sturdy horse and its four legs. Could we allow the symbolism to take one a little further in the spirit of the philosophy of the Royale? Are not the four cardinal Virtues reminiscent of the four cardinal points, north, south, east, and west, les points cardinaux. And the four Aristotelian elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Clear signs of the réel, or our rootedness in this material world. And does not the trio of faith, hope, and charity make us think of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Where a poetical metaphysic will allow these virtues to elucidate truths about each person of the Blessed Trinity. We have seen that Peggy's voice of God, who speaks as God the Father and associates faith with the evidence of the Creator's work in the world, and evokes the example of love offered by his son. Although neither Peggy nor Peggy's voice of God, speaking through <laughs> the Gervais, says as much, all the signs are there that hope should make us speak, think of the Holy Spirit, whom we constantly beseech to renew the face of the earth. This hymn to hope is surely also a hymn to the Holy Spirit, whom we implore to refresh us and remake us. Without your spirit, there is nothing in man. 
um, Veni Creato Spiritus, um, Mentes Tuorum Visita, you know, but um, there's the other one, isn't there? Um, Veni Sancti Spiritus. Da 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 about kind of stopping us becoming rigid and all this sort of thing. So without your spirit, there's nothing in man, nothing that is more, not harmful. Cleanse whatever is unclean, water whatever is dry, heal whatever is wounded, bend what is inflexible, ignite whatever is frozen, correct whatever goes astray. Can we not say then that just as this little hope, this little girl hope renews her guardian's faith in charity, so it's the Holy Spirit that renews our devotion to the Father and the Son who otherwise can just sort of seem distant somehow, even though, even though the sun is incarnate, interceding from within us in size too deep for words. I draw attention to more out of many aspects of hope, to two more aspects of hope as portrayed by Peggy in this masterpiece. First, the way in which Peggy, or perhaps Madame Gervais, through her folksy representation of God, is himself... Uh, this, this God is able to be hopeful and therefore somehow draw us into his own hope, this friendly old granddad God who's so hopeful, um, through a power of human attraction. You just want to be, you want to be hopeful like old granddaddy God is hopeful. It's a, it's a human, a real thing. At the end of the poem, God is represented as praising the way in which children understand that night is better than day because that is when God is in charge. And yet adults refuse to sleep, failing to place their trust in God. God hopes that the fulfillment of the age will come soon. Here, as throughout the portal, the voice of God is redolent of the beautiful mythic naivety of the Petit Prince, which is much later, uh, Antoine Saint-Exupéry. Um, you tell me of the great silence there will be after the end of the reign of man when I will take up my scepter once more. This is Peggy. And sometimes I look forward to that because this man really makes a lot of noise. That's God speaking about the night and about he's kind of weary with man. And the poem ends with God's humble expression of gratitude to Lady Night for having covered the descent from the cross and the burial of Christ, his son, with a veil of discreet darkness. The lasting impression, however, of this little girl hope is of her playfulness and a certain unpredictability. Peggy tells of a playful God, of a playful believer, and looks forward even to a playful church whose heart is constantly rejuvenated by hope. For children playing, working, resting, stopping, running are all one. All the same, it's all the same thing. They make no distinction, they're just happy. They enjoy themselves all the time, as much when they are working as when they are playing. They don't even notice, they are very happy. Hope is also she who enjoys herself all the time. But this joy is grounded. It's not merely a terrestrial joy that makes despair and tragedy and is ultimately terrified of death. It looks forward, as we've said before, to the joys of heaven. In fact, when we read Peggy, we come to see that this playful and childlike joy is true and real only if reality gives us a real reason to hope. Chesterton, in many ways quite similar to Peggy, once wrote that if we are to be truly gay, we must believe that there is some eternal gaiety in the nature of things. Very medieval sort of idea. And you think of all those paintings of saints smiling and dancing in heaven. Um, so John Paul II boldly asserted, we wish to proclaim that apart from the mercy of God, there is no other hope for mankind. And Pope Francis in his exegesis on the parable of the prodigal son also explains at the very beginning of his pontificate, that it is the father's mercy um, shown to us by Christ, which is the very reason of our hope. Jesus shows us this merciful patience of God so that we can regain confidence, hope, always. Let's talk about the second. In keeping with the intuition of the popes, we can observe, um, actually that was Pope Francis I was quoting there. In keep keeping with the 
intuition of the popes then we can observe that this is surely the centrality of Christ's mercy that is essential to this rediscovery of the virtue of hope. For as Newman claimed, God is not only almighty, but all merciful also. Faith is founded on the knowledge that God is almighty. Hope is founded on the knowledge that God is all merciful. This is Newman speaking. The presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, excites us to hope quite as much as to faith, because his very name, Jesus, means Savior, and because he was so loving and meek and bountiful when he was on the earth. And it is the assurance of God's mercy which enabled French spirituality, overly covered, colored for centuries by the gloomy influence of Jansenism, and further wounded by the revolution, to reject the pessimism of Vigny and the limitations of Pascal, and embrace, embrace the generous and expansive childlike hope of Peggy. In our world today, no less fractured than that of 1914, if we Christians, as St. Peter invites us to do, would really give an account of the hope that is in us, then the world might at last return to faith and love and be healed. The truth of God's mercy means that death need no hold no fear for us, and the hope we have received from him should lighten our lives and give us joy. The message is as much waiting to be rediscovered in our age as it was in 1911. The reality of death and the blessed hope of heaven, which for the believer is every bit as real, should keep us always watchful, always cheerful, always childlike, like the ten wise virgins who'd abun whose abundant store of oil symbolizes the abundant hope in their hearts. The English Catholic poet Alexander Pope, who died in 1744, beautifully synthesizes, synthesizes these comforting thoughts in this line from his, these lines from his essay on man. Hope humbly then with trembling pinions soar, wait the great teacher death and God adore. What future bliss he gives not thee to know, but gives that hope to be thy blessing now. Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Man never is, but always to be blessed. The soul uneasy and confined from home rests and expatiates in a life to come. Anyway, I hope that I haven't gone over my time, but perhaps I have. <laughs> what time is it? Uh, tw 28. Um, I have a question. May I, may I, can we have any questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah, quickly. Yeah, a couple of minutes. Just, I, I just want one thing. Um, you might have to answer it yourself. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I don't know the French answer to answer this, yeah. answer this question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you, you mentioned that, uh, um, which I, I knew that, that um, Peggy was uh, initially a supporter of um, Jaurès, who's still a great, a huge figure in left-wing French politics, um, and then he broke with him, which I, I had known. But do you know anything about why he broke with him? This I know nothing about. Um, I'm afraid not, because um, most of the information about Peggy's early life I got from conversations with you. Ah. <laughs> so, um, I, I think I think he broke with him because this is Anthony talking. Mm. Mm. Uh, but the sound cut out just as he was about to say why. Anthony, put your microphone on. Your microphone's cut oh. off. There you go. Is it on? It's no. all right now. Yeah, I think that Jaurès was not in favour of a um, robust attitude to Germany before the war. Right, right, right. And so he was more. Uh, kind of international proletariat. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a communist, but but yeah. And whereas, obviously, as we've just heard, Peggy was very, um, you know, he believed in La France. And uh, yes, well, that was that was why Jaurès was shot down, of course. I, I, but I, I, well, he was shot down because somebody um, read what Peggy had written in the last oh, really? cahier, saying, "Who will silence this great voice?" Really. Like, uh, and some lunatic like Henry the Second took, took this literally, and that and Peggy never wrote anything else after that, and immediately joined up and was killed on the second day of the Battle of the Marne. How interesting! All, all this is in Geoffrey Hill's great poem, the mm. mystery, the mystery mm. of the charity of Charles Peggy. Mm. Ah, so well, yeah, yeah, fascinating, very dramatic. And, and, My goodness. and there's a lot about whether whether a man is responsible. Mm. You know, for what people who follow his words. Mm. 
and there's also oh. a great great line which is relevant to some of the things that Peggy said I mean this in Jeffrey Hill about that they were preparing the table for morning mass from which and this is Jeffrey Hill from which he stood aside to find salvation hmm. Hmm. because he didn't like the kind of well he didn't like the, some of the clericalism and the yeah. sentimentality of the Anyway, I mean, that, that, sorry, I'm not, it's not No, 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 that, thank you, thank you. I didn't know I that, see, that detail. Interesting. Thank you, Anthony. Has anybody else got any questions or can we go to <coughs> Joseph Pierce now who's waiting patiently? Is he, is he that? Yeah, Joseph's there. I'm, I'm, I'm using my phone here, so I can't see what, 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 what we're supposed to be doing timetable.